My name is Mihai Sora. I'm the project director at the Lowy Institute OzPNG Network. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather tonight, the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, and their continued cultural, spiritual, and historical connection to the area, stretching back tens of thousands of years. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and all First Nations people here tonight. It is an honor to gather here amongst distinguished guests, leaders in your fields, advocates, supporters, as we launch our Emerging Leaders Dialogue Report on First Nations foreign policy. The Emerging Leaders Dialogue is our annual flagship activity at the Australia Papua New Guinea Network Project, a Lowy Institute initiative supported by the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade that aims to build links and understanding between our two countries, Australia and Papua New Guinea. Over five days, dialogue participants explored the theme of First Nations foreign policy, focusing on development and human security issues relevant to Papua New Guinea and Australia. Session themes span from diplomacy, development, defense, to sport, media, arts, business, and culture. To give you a sense of the week, we prepared a short highlights video that I'd like to play for you now before I continue. Good is that? <laughs> um, I really like that video because it makes it look like everything went perfectly that week. <laughs> um, look, we covered a lot of ground in that week and we tried to capture as much of the insights and the inputs in the report that some of you are holding tonight. Um, we've set up a, a table uh, in the middle of the room if you get a chance tonight, please grab a copy, grab two, grab one for your friend. Those insights in, in that book, they represent the inputs of our participants, our emerging leaders. My colleague Jess and I, we curated the report, but all of the content, all of the ideas, anything that's valuable in that report came from the group that was with us in Cannes, some of whom you'll hear from this evening. All the mistakes are uh, obviously 
my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I think I wanted to reflect on a couple of things that I learned from, from that week. And one is that the discussions really stressed for me how the active involvement of First Nations Australians in diplomatic roles is absolutely essential for ensuring Australia's foreign policy and development programs are not only culturally sensitive, but also inclusive. And I think nowhere is that more relevant and applicable for Australia than in the Pacific and its relationships with those Pacific countries. The recommendations in the report, and there are many, as have been noted, they've, they've been crafted by our emerging leaders and they're not intended to be prescriptive. I see them as creative, but practical and actionable ideas that aim to harness the power of indigenous knowledge, cultural exchange and mutual respect. Knowledge, culture and respect. That's what I took away from that week. I invite each of you here this evening to, to question, to offer insights and to engage with these ideas as we continue our dialogue, which I believe has the potential to elevate and offer a better future of relations between Australia, Papua New Guinea and all Pacific countries. In a moment, I will invite Mr. Justin Muhammad, Australia's Ambassador for First Nations Peoples, to deliver our keynote remarks for the evening. After that, my colleague, Dr. Jess Collins, will introduce you to some of our emerging leaders so you can hear for yourselves the passion and the wisdom that we were lucky to have with us for that week in Cairns. Our work is only possible with the support of DFAT and the Australian High Commission in Port Moresby, and of course, all of you who have joined us here this evening. So thank you once again. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now invite Mr. Justin Muhammad, Australia's ambassador for First Nations people to deliver this evening's keynote remarks. Wang Yang, Justin Muhammad, Garang Garang. Um, really pleased to be, be here tonight and uh, thank you for sharing um, the short video which was there. Um, I didn't realize um, it kind of flashed back, but uh, I was here, I was, sorry, not here, but in Cairns when the very first time the group came together and I, you couldn't pick two different places from Cairns to Canberra. Uh, <laughs> I think it was around about um, October in Cairns and uh, June here in Canberra, so big difference. <laughs> but um, with all jokes aside, I uh, really want to just say um, congratulations, but thank you for taking the time and the dedication over the last 12 months because it takes that. And um, in saying that, the um, want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we stand on we meet here in Canberra, the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of this beautiful place we call Canberra and many of the national decisions are made. Um, many people come here and visit work for short periods of time and sometimes longer periods of time. And the traditional owners of this land and um, Ngunnawal people and the Gambri people have always open their, their lands up, their hearts, their love and their connection to anyone who calls Canberra home. And um, five of my children spent time here growing up and going to school and my wife and I have close connections here um, through um, the traditional owners just wanting to make sure that um, people who spend time here, they get the full essence of what this place is about. It's not, it may be the capital of Australia, that's very important. And maybe where the Prime Minister and politicians spend most of their time, that's important as well. But most importantly, the First Nations people of these lands have kept these lands and have been able to keep these lands at a level for all of us to enjoy. So hope you enjoy your time, people that have travelled here, to be here. It is my privilege, um, as mentioned, um, as the inaugural ambassador of First Nations people, um, when I think about um, Cairns in October, it was actually the 16th of October when um, the, we, we met on Monday and on the f uh, 15th of October on the Sunday, I jumped on the plane to fly to Cairns and we had that plus another fuller meeting with the, um, um, the, of the Pacific around climate and, um, and the impacts of climate and, and, and very important the solutions. But on the 14th of October was the referendum and um, so how fast time flies from that point of time. But I was saying earlier, I hopped on the plane on the Sunday thinking, where's the future gonna go, you know, the, this role, my place, my family, my children, my wife, et cetera, about exactly where do we move forward with. And um, a day spending um, or a morning spending time with um, many of the people that are in this room here, 
and then another three or four days um, in Port Douglas with many of our brothers and sisters across the Pacific um, working and talking about the climate and the challenges that are ahead, that, that face us, that, we, that impact us, um, including the great solutions and traditional knowledges that we all bring to the table. It really rejuvenated um, the batteries. It gave a resting place, all the above, um, to walk away and go. There's a, you know, we've got so much to do. Um, in, you know, still to in front of us, but collectively as a family of the Pacific and PNG is very much our closest um, country, but closest relatives um, for us to be able to work together and move through the ups and downs, the the the, the victories, but also sometimes the very hard challenges that we all face. And that was a really great start um, to a new chapter in Australia's um, history and its, um, and its life. And now here we are in 2024. Um, and this role and this program um, after, you know, going through the, the time that you've had together to be able to launch this um, very important, um, you know, this, this report. Um, I'm glad to see that I feature in a couple of pages. That's great. <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> um, but it, it is, it's really important for the Australian government. Uh, I know that. I know it's very important for the Papua New Guinea government as well, that our relationship is something which is not just, um, just moves when there's the right people in the right, in the right spaces who want to work together, but probably the most importantly, that we work together and we see each other that we are, whatever we do in Australia, whatever Papua New Guinea do, Papua New Guineans do, that collectively it doesn't it does have an impact, positively, positively or negatively. And we do need to have frameworks around that to ensure that the future leaders, which some are in this room here, um, the people that are in leadership today making decisions, that we all have a very important part to play to ensure our home base, our close connections across the Pacific. Is something we look after, we value, and we take care of. And so, I this um, report, First Nations Foreign Policy, is strengthening the Australian and Papua New Guinea ties, is very much part of that. In my role as the ambassador of First Nations people, I often say around the world, if we can't get our relationship with Papua New Guinea um, right, um, and the treaty which sits there in the Torres Strait, and I'll speak about that a little bit um, later in my speech. Uh, we've got, um, you yeah, know, if we can't get that right, well, then we really shouldn't be doing much more outside of that because we've got to get our home base right first and foremostly. And um, the, our relationship with Papua New Guinea is one of our very, very, very important relationships, not just for this government and not just for the governments of past, but for tens of thousands of years, these relationships and connections and kinship continues. So the Australian government has launched the office of this role as, um, as the ambassador for First Nations people, international engagement. I'm proud to lead that. It's an inaugural role, it's a first of. Um, I was only in a few months before I came and spoke to the uh, delegation up there in Cairns, so hopefully I've got more to share tonight. Um, but it's 12 months, just over 12 months into the role. And um, for the first time through my role as ambassador and through the office, Australia has dedicated First Nations represent representation in our international engagement. Now, please hear me correctly, because I'm sure it's the same in Papua New Guinea. Um, I'm not the first ambassador, or the first diplomat as a, for, as a First Nations Australian, but as Australian government, I'm the first appointed Australian government by the Australian government as an ambassador of First Nations people. But we all know that many of our ancestors has have advocated, have fought, have designed, have been holder of the pen, have also been able to negotiate for the best interest of not only for the time that they were living, but also for the future generations, which I think many of us here who have connections um, to as Indigenous people, as First Nations people, um, that we can say thank you that we've been able to now stand here and play our part in history. So the Australian government is committed um, and for the, you know, you would have, don't have to um, look too far than this week, I think we've got seven ministers in Papua New Guinea as I speak right now. Um, I was on standby for the whole of the weekend, Nelly, <laughs> about do I hop on a plane on Monday to fly up there? Um, but um, that wasn't the case. I'm very privileged to be here and um, say thank you. That's right. 
<laughs> so you got me. <laughs> the rest of government's in Papua New Guinea from Australia. No, but um, that's our commitment. That's the Australian government's commitment to make sure we elevate our one, elevate for our First Nations people here in Australia into our foreign policies and our connections to the Pacific and in this case, the Papua New Guinea, is that government to government, our First Nations connections, our cultural connections, our from millennia, our connections together that we can bring them into our government documents, our policies, our agreements, and how we work, work together and move forward, not only just for our two nations, but also for the rest of the Pacific. So um, I've already mentioned a few things in my speech, but their historical links with Papua New Guinea is not, is, um, you know, no better exemplified with the Torres Strait Islands and, and um, Papua New Guinea. Um, this relationship has been around for thousands of years and you can go up there right now to the, the most um, northern part, the islands of the Torres Strait and stand on the, the shore of the Torres Strait. You can look across on a fine day and um, see the, um, the lands of Papua New Guinea and then speaking to the traditional people up there, traditional owners, the connections that they share and the stories and and not only just share with the connections of culture, but also family where there's grandchildren on both sides of that treaty. Um, and, and so the investment is more than just what is here and now, it's just about the future generations. So this vibrant relationship maintained through these interactions, um, as mentioned, particularly in those Torres Strait Treaty villages and the coastal communities of Papua New Guinea, demonstrate a, a shared heritage and the interwined destinies that transcend modern nations' na um, national boundaries. I still say on my international um, colleagues when I travel that um, this treaty that we have, that, that this boundary that kind of sits within the waterways of, um, of our two countries is, um, will have to be, there's not many like this. Um, so close by landmass, I think it's about 14 to 16 minutes on the boat across with modern technology, with motors and so forth. Um, it was a bit longer in the days before that. <laughs> um, but it is very close and to have a treaty which sits in between that, but nations that are connected in so many ways, it's, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's an asset that we have in this region and it's something which we can demonstrate if it's managed properly, if it's... Um, if the right people, when I say the right people, the people that have lived and been part of those two very close boundaries, if they have more ownership and more influence and more control over how that works, that it's going to be an example for the rest of the world and many other regions and many other countries which have boundaries or um, that separate country to country, people to people. And we, we know there's plenty of those that exist. And I think we can be, we can show the world of, in many ways of how we can have an international border, but how that can be worked and be um, transcended across. And we know that treaty helps to keep those cultural connections that so people can move between each the two countries and to have that connections. So over the past decade, the Australian and the Papua New Guinea network and the Lower, the Lower Institute, um, Institute project supported by DFED, as mentioned, has emerged as a, a pivotal platform for leadership and collaboration. It has brought together emerging leaders from diverse back backgrounds, each committed to transcending the geographically borders, as I mentioned, to shape a future that honours our shared past while innovatively tackling present and emerging challenges. The release of the report on the First Nations foreign policy strengthening Australian PNG ties is a testament to this transformative approach. It demonstrates our commitment to inclusivity, cultural sensitivity and progressive thinking in international relations. This year, the Emerging Leaders Dialogue brought cultural connections to the forefront, something that's close to my heart. It's, um, it's a long time overdue. Um, many of the connections that we've had and many of the dialogues that we've had between government to government, and especially I'll speak on, the, on behalf of the Australian government and which is partly why this role has been created and I'm honoured to be the inaugural ambassador, that Australia has to bring more of our First Nations culture and connections to our government relationships with other countries within the Pacific. It's moving far, far past the times where it's just 
not just, but the conversations, relationships with built-in economies or security or potential opportunities for trade, but the cultural connections that we have across the Pacific are the things that have lasted tens of thousands of years and which will continue to be there for many thousands of years in, um, into the future. So embedding First Nations pers um, perspectives, we ensure that our policies are not only inclusive but representative. This report recognises the opportunities to deepen our connections and expand our collaboration across sectors such as education, healthcare, economic development, environmental um, management, reaffirming the importance of people-to-people -people links um, under the Australian Papua New Guinea Comprehensive Str um, Strategic and Economic Partnerships. The report re provides strategic recommendations um, to enhance our bilateral engagement through di diplomatic channels, cultural exchanges and educational collaborations. I'm not going to go through all of these, but just a few. The first, and I think very importantly, as already mentioned, to consider Indigenous partic participation in diplomacy and development. First Nations perspectives, knowledges and leadership should be central to our efforts to foster and sustain closer ties. Many other things will fade away as the test of the future brings, as we've seen just more recently, of how pandemics and climate can really alter the economy, can alter government's decisions and focus. But First Nations perspectives, knowledges and leadership, um, they've always been central to many of us and they will continue to be central. And to be able to foster those, they will continue to keep us, our ties very, very close. Secondly, the strengthening Indigenous business relationships between Australia and Papua New Guinea, with the emphasis on empowering Indigenous women through forums, mentorships and innovation grants are so, so important. Um, I'm a father of four daughters and one son, so my son and I will always say, yep, yeah, they're very, very important. Uh, <laughs> it's, but it is, um, I say that and we have a laugh, but if you don't have a strategic approach to this, um, it won't happen um, because people who privilege or have the easy ride to it, which is usually us men, um, can tend sometimes to forget, even in my, even in my own family. Um, but to have a reminder that we've got to do this, but not just a reminder, but a commitment and a strategic approach to it, will not only be, it's not only a good thing, but it's strategically is, is something that's going to make us stronger and more richer for it. And I applaud all the women in this room, especially the ones who have been a part of this program and who contributed to this, because I know that you play a very important role to your family and um, as ambassador of First Nations people, as a male, um, I know my wife spends a lot of time worrying about where the kids are and what they're doing and making sure that the home is right and she's got a full-time job as well. Um, so I, I understand the value and the perspectives that women bring to the, to the work that we do and the expertise but the innovation that comes is something which we're going to be better for and we've experienced that and we've got to keep fostering that and I'm, sure, I'm pleased to say that Australian government has committed to ensure that we play a role to do what we can do within the Pacific to ensure that ta takes um, further steps in the right direction. Thirdly, exploring the co-design of the climate adaption strategies. We know that climate's going to affecting all of us, but these strategies could inter um, how they can integrate in traditional knowledge and knowledge systems from both Indigenous Australian and Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinean communities, um, together with scientific expertise is something we're seeing more and more of. We're making progress area through initiatives such as range of programs, traditional knowledge exchange and volunteer programs. This is becoming more and more not only just for the Pacific but globally. The US, I was recently in Hawaii, with the, you would have seen their big fires that they had over there, the bushfires, they're looking to Australia, looking to our cultural burning practices um, and I'm sure traditional knowledge is something which is going to provide are very much solutions to many of the key areas that we're trying to combat with with climate change. And I hope and I um, believe that we'll be able to do this far effectively with traditional knowledges at the forefront and at the table when we're talking about climate change. So these recommendations are not just about maintaining our connections, but are about enriching and expanding them to ensure that our future collaborations are equitable, respectful and re representative of our shared identity. 
to everyone who is who has contributed to this report, which I've seen it's floating around, thank you so much for your efforts. It makes my job easier for sure that I've got a report like this and I know it's coming from people who know the system. Um, I can't be the expert on every. I'm not the expert on everything, that's for sure. Just ask my kids that. Um, but it, it, it does make um, roles like myself and other political leaders or people that have got a, um, a voice at a table, it makes us... It makes our role easier. It really does, because I, if I pick up that report which is sitting on that table there, I can quote things and I can say and talk about things in in confidence that it's been pulled together with the right people who's contributed into it, not someone who's been sitting and hasn't got no experience of what these um, recommendations are saying, but people who've experienced when things aren't being done, but also have got the experiences when innovation and action has been taken place. So that makes uh, makes my job, as I said, so much easier, easier. So I'm gonna finish, I think I've spoken long enough, but I'm very eager to see the discussions later tonight, um, there's a few more conversations. And I um, wanna say once again, congratulations, and I'm looking forward to our ongoing um, relationships, our, um, our work together with Papua New Guinea and Australia, and as a First Nations person of Australia and from Queensland, which is a pretty good time at the moment, state of origin's on, um, <laughs> but as a Queensland and very close to the Papua New Guinea, um, Papua New Guinea, as I said, as a, as a nation to nation, um, we've got, um, I want to make sure that we do our ancestors proud, that we keep these, these cultural ties strong, um, we keep our governments accountable to those cultural ties and that it's not one or the other, it is interwoven to, 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 with each other, with modern science, modern policies, but our cultural connections is something that has brought us to this far and we'll, I'm sure will get us to um, the next century and beyond that. Thank you. Well, there you go. Um, thank you so much, Justin. Uh, we feel very privileged that you've joined us not once but twice on our program. Um, we're really hanging our hat on that, so thank you. <laughs> thanks for being with us. And thank you to your team that has supported us through this journey um, and made your presence here this evening possible. Um, some of you are out there. Thank you so much for helping us out. Now, something that became apparent very quickly during our dialogue is that First Nations foreign policy means different things to different people. And what better way to explore this than by hearing from our emerging leaders directly? Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to my colleague, Dr. Jess Collins, who will guide you through the next part of the evening. Jess was the lead compiler of this report. Um, if there is anything that Lowy added in terms of quality, it came from Jess. And her, along with Josh Godding, our masterful digital producer, um, they have helped me deliver two Emerging Leaders Dialogues, um, and for that I will be eternally grateful. Jess, I'm handballing to you now. Well, one thing I know about Loi is that we're very good at passing the credit on, and this report is absolutely because of the brain's trust of the Emerging Leaders. And we call them the emerging leaders, but they are not. They are leaders here and now. They're amazing, they are brilliant, and they're the ones that led all these discussions. These are all their ideas, and this is what we're all here to hear about. Now, we've run two ELDs now, and we've also learned that all these emerging leaders lean right in. And when we put out the call out for tonight and said, who wants to come down to Canberra and speak about you know, what they learned and their ideas, Six people put their hand up. So our panel has grown. We're gonna take a slightly different format tonight. We're gonna to hear about five minutes from each of the panelists about what they learned on the ELD, the reflections on it, uh, their ideas. We might hear some new ones tonight, who knows? <laughs> so first up, we're going to have Dr. Anita Togolo, and she's a Bougainvillean Australian woman. She's an anthropologist, a very rare breed. I'm one of them as well. If there's anybody else in the room, please put your hand up. I'm gonna come over and say hi. She's a founding member of an indigenous owned recruitment consultancy called Three Emus Recruitment. 
and she received a doctorate from, doctorate from the ANU and she focused on Indigenous entrepreneurship and landowner businesses in PNG's mining sector. Annalisa Mopio jane she has a diverse background in sports, counselling and professional speaking. But she has over 20 years experience in the sports industry, including representing Papua New Guinea in swimming at the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. She represented in three Commonwealth Games and five World Championships. She's a legend. Annalisa is a sports counsellor and passionate about athletes' well-being as well. Anthony Stewart is the Digital Content Manager, Content Manager at ABC International Services. He's previously a broadcast journalist across Australia, and for the past four years, he's focused on the Pacific Islands and spearheaded the development and launch of ABC Pacific which is a digital brand engaging right across the Pacific, including Papua New Guinea, absolutely critical to building those ties and the knowledge and the literacy between Australia and Papua New Guinea right across the Pacific. Absolutely terrific. Dylan Mayo, I'm going to call you doctor tonight. He's just handed in his thesis. It's <laughs> not yet official, but you may as well have the doctor title already. What an absolute amazing achievement to, to Dylan. He's an agricultural scientist, passionate about using science and local knowledge to improve food security. His work, uh, his thesis was supporting a traditional owner group to develop one of their indigenous food plants into a modern day crop. He also went to Papua New Guinea in 2019 as a New Colombo scholar, so he's got terrific experience to talk about tonight. Jenna Halls is a project, project manager for international development at Ninti One Limited focusing on First Nations participation in the international development sector. Jenna works in an advisory capacity with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and is, uh, has a passion for strengthening cultural connections between First Nations Australians and Papua New Guinea. And Alan Tarago, Tarago uh, Key, First Nations man from far north Queensland, consultant, was a consultant at EY, and I've just learned tonight he's got a brand new job. Uh, he is an analyst with APT uh, and he's on the Australian domestic team. Uh, but he does have experience in infrastructure and policy uh, and research in the government sector. And uh, he's particularly passionate about infrastructure, Indigenous affairs and sustainable development. So look, I might invite uh, Anita up first to give you your five minutes and your thoughts and reflections and perhaps an idea or two. Good evening, Olgeta, uh, Bonia Toro. Um, my name is Anita Togolo. My, uh, I am from Rovana in Bougainville, the autonomous region of Bougainville in Papua New Guinea. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, custodians of the lands that we meet on this evening. And some of you uh, who have travelled um, to Canberra, you may not know that um, Canberra was uh, a very important meeting place for um, several uh, Indigenous groups, the, the Ngunnawal, the Ngambri, um, the, the Narago. It was, it was a very important place for trade, um, ceremony, uh, marriage, and um, it, it wasn't um, defined by um, territory borders. Um, so it's a very special place that uh, we're gathering here tonight. Um, as Jess said, um, I was one of the lucky enough to be one of the participants um, of the Emerging Leaders Dialogue last year. I actually just scraped in um, as as the maximum age was 40. So um, I'm not sure how that happened. I was actually very surprised that I got accepted. Um, but I thought I'll give it a go because it's um, an area that's very close to my heart. Um, I am also a director of an Indigenous recruitment company, um, three EMUs recruitment. Um, my partner is also here tonight. Um, he is from uh, West Sipic, and our Indigenous partner is um, Gamilaroi. 
And so I thought oh, I, I should know a little bit about, uh, you know, contributing to First Nations. Um, and my partner also corrected me when I said that Papua New Guinea uh, is not Indigenous, we, call, we are Papua New Guineans, but it's true that um, we are we are indigenous to to Papua New Guinea. Um, I thought um, I was quite nervous when um, I arrived at, at the event, um, not knowing people. But you know, there was twenty of us, uh, ten Papua New Guineans, um, and also ten um, Australians and um, First Nations. Australians as well and um, it was what I got out of um, the dialogue was connection, um, this deep connection between um, First Nations Australians and um, Papua New Guineans that um, you know, spans tens of thousands of years and we probably don't know the half of it. Um, and and the discussions that we had um, and the connections that we made were very important. Um, and the learning, um, the cultural exchange between, between us was uh, a highlight for me. Um, so I'm an anthropologist, but also a consultant um, for a um, environmental social impact assessment uh, firm. And um, the one thing um, that came out of this, um, the discussions for me was um, the deep knowledge um, that Indigenous peoples have, our ways of, of knowing, um, of being and doing is within us. We walk with that. Um, it underpins how we see the world and how we choose to interact with the world, um, whether it's through our relationships or the work that we do. And it is something that we can't um, deny, uh, despite um, the, the different histories, colonial histories, um, systems, um, that are foreign to us were um, enforced upon us. And I think it is um, our role through um, our um, personal uh, work relationships um, and in the work that we do that we um, challenge um, those systems where required to make meaningful change and all of the work that um, all of the participants do is very important in um, in making changes uh, small changes um, large changes in in our everyday um, interactions through different sectors um, whether it's in um, Indigenous entrepreneurship, in sports diplomacy, climate change, uh, gender and inclusivity oh. in international development, agriculture, infrastructure, the, the ways that we know and that we live can not only solve Indigenous challenges, but global challenges, because the knowledge that we have is deep and it is something that we are very grateful for all our ancestors that have had to challenge this system as well. Um, I wanted to say thank you as well to the Lowy Institute um, for, for giving us this opportunity to participate and also to um, come here tonight for the launch of the report. And it was wonderful to meet um, 
our First Nations ambassador, Justin Mohammed, as well. Um, thank you, everyone. I think that's all. <laughs>
you know, such a great diversity of people. I think one of the things, you know, you can go to events like this and you just meet the same people, but there were people from all walks of work, life, Olympians, nurses, anthropologists, um, you know, all kinds of people. And it just helped us have a richer experience. Um, I also really want to thank the fellow participants. You know, they, all of them came with like openness and a generosity of mind and spirit that meant that, you know, we all got something amazing out of it. You know, this dialogue happened in the shadow of the no vote. And so for a lot of the Indigenous participants, I think it was a really raw time. Um, and I'm really grateful to not just them, but all the Indigenous people who came and spoke to us at that time and, and shared, you know, really at a really vulnerable time for a lot of people, a time of great sadness. Um, and so it was just, I was really grateful as a white Australian to be there for that. Um, I'm Anthony Stewart. I'm the Digital Content Manager for ABC International Services. And as Jess pointed out, yes, I helped launch ABC Pacific. Um, and I guess as a journalist and storyteller by training, I really was trying to think about what is the story that Australia and PNG tell about our relationship. And I think that the relationship and the story that we tell is constantly rooted in colonization and independence, but it, to, to a big extent, the public imagination and what people understand in Australia is not defined by that long history of a, a relationship of thousands of years. I think most Australian people wouldn't know that the border of Australia and, and Papua New Guinea is only a few kilometres at Saibai. And so I think when I came away from it, I, I, you know, I, I really reflected on how we as the media do need to do better at that, but also how that story can actually strengthen our relationship with places like Papua New Guinea and the broader Pacific. Um, you know, this morning I heard a politician say, um, you know, our, our PNG brothers and sisters. And I, I really thought it was interesting because I think that the definitive quality of that relationship is actually that there are families that have brothers and sisters inside by between PNG and Australia. And, and we don't celebrate that. And if we did celebrate it in a greater extent, we would strengthen our relationship and redefine what it means to be Australia in the Pacific, um, separated from the kind of, you know, recognising our long history in the region, but kind of helping to recalibrate our relationship. And I guess that what, what you're doing, Justin, that's the, the, the reason that the foreign minister, I guess, has tapped you on the shoulder to try and do that. Um, but I really think that, you know, as a media professional, we have an obligation to try and help, um, you know, in, find people who can tell those stories there's a, a colleague of mine, Jacob Maguire. He's a South Sea Islander man, um, also has ties into Vanuatu. Um, and I think that it, it, at an organisation like the ABC and particularly at Radio Australia and at ABC Pacific, finding people and encouraging people who have those qualities to come and work for us, as well as all the people from Papua New Guinea, from all those other places, will really help strengthen the stories that we can share and tell. Um, I think the... The other thing I wanted to, to just touch on is the, the, the camaraderie that, that's established by something like this. Um, we, it's pretty rare to get to spend a week with anyone, let alone, you know, <laughs> let alone your family. Um, so, <laughs> so it's been really wonderful to build like friendships and uh, have them separated from work in a way that will allow us hopefully as you know our connection to png and our connection to australia and our connection to indigenous communities um grows to kind of uh to help that to define you know the future that we want to make it um you know i think i was i learned so much um i really wanted to when i was in the room i really wanted to listen because like because of the the time that it was and i wanted to hear from our indigenous and png colleagues and it was just an amazing time. I learned so much and for that I'm really grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Now we're gonna hear from Dr. Dylan Mayle. Thank you, Jess. Soon to be a doctor, um, not an Olympian. Um, I'm an agricultural scientist. <laughs> 
Um, it's great to be here tonight, and I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of what, where we meet today, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, um, who have cared for and used uh, this land for um, tens of thousands of years. Um, I guess, yeah, I echo what everyone else has said tonight, how great the um, dialogue was just to connect with other participants and as a non-Indigenous Australian to sit back and listen to the perspectives and learn from the knowledges and experiences of our um, First Nations Australians and Papua New Guineans. Um, so a bit about my connection to PNG. Back in 2019, I was studying agricultural science at Charles Sturt University. I'd grown up on a farm on Radjuri country um, near Wagga Wagga, um, and both my parents were from generational farming families. Um, and I kind of grew up in the millennium drought, which is a time which probably many of us who lived around this area could remember. We had um, big dust storms, um, a lot of, I remember on my farm, crops withering away from droughts, um, livestock unable to find water. And that kind of, it was a very kind of an emotional thing for my family and I wanted to pursue a career um, where I could help um, farmers overcome some of these challenges um, to um, things like climate change and food security. Um, so that's what led me to do an ag agricultural science degree. Um, I received an email about um, a program called the New Colombo Plan. The New Colombo Plan is a signature initiative of the Australian government, which aims to support undergraduate students to go out into the Indo-Pacific region and have these really deep transformative um, cultural exchanges um, and to gain lived experience in the region. Um, I applied for it and when I was going to apply for it, I was trying to think about where I wanted to go. And it was kind of, there was 40 countries to choose from. Um, so a lot of choice, but PNG really um, kind of drew me towards it. Um, firstly, because um, PNG has such a diversity of, you know, different food plants and different agricultural systems. And um, yeah, there's kind of findings in the highlands that the highlands of PNG highlanders up there were the um, one of the first, some of the first agriculturalists in the world developed independently from other parts of the world. So I knew there was such a wealth of knowledge in PNG on agriculture and um, food security. Um, second kind of reason was that at my home institution at the time, uh, for the new Colombo plan, there's two kind of streams. There's a scholarship program, which supports about a bit over 100 people a year to go out into the region for long-term experiences. And then there's the mobility program, which supports more short-term big groups going out um, into the region. And um, yeah, my home university had, for the last couple of years leading up to that, had sent out groups to PNG. So there were some existing connections there. So once I started um, kind of talking with lecturers and you know my mentors and that, that was somewhere I really wanted to go. Um, when I went to PNG, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't know who I would meet, what experiences I would have. Um, I didn't know anyone in PNG, even in Australia, I hadn't come across any Papua New Guineans. Um, it was a bit daunting because uh, as maybe many of us, or I know as a non-Indigenous Australian, um, there's this stereotype that PNG mightn't be the safest place to go to. I know from my family, there were some concerns there. So it was quite um, daunting, but by the end of my time in PNG, um, it was, incredibly profoundly transformative. I got to, you know, do a semester exchange in Ley at the PNG University of Technology. I made great friends, um, probably, yeah, that's endure today and probably will endure my lifetime. Um, I gained a deep understanding into, just from a year in PNG into um, what life in Papua New Guinea is like. And I ended up learning so much more from my time there than I could ever kind of give to people there. Like, um, especially when I was doing my honors research on um, sweet potato, um, kind of with my agricultural science kind of background, we we're looking at how to control sweet potato weevils in um, up in the highlands. And I learned so much more from the farmers up there than I could ever tell them. And yeah, it was very, that exchange was, um, yeah, just something that was very valuable. So, over the new Colombo plan, it's a 
been a 10 year program. It was founded in 2014 and has supported over a thousand scholars now to go out into the Indo-Pacific. Um, out of that thousand, um, very minimal number has have chosen PNG. I think it's about five. So kind of one of my kind of recommendations and you will see in the report when it comes to the new Colombo plan is um, asking why the, that number is low. Um, how can we get more Australians to go to PNG and have that kind of transformative experience? And really, it's the best way to understand um, PNG, which is our closest neighbour. Upon returning from my time in PNG, it made me reflect as well. Um, I was there and I was working with um, Papua New Guineans who own the land, they, um, you know, agriculture is um, a big thing. A lot of people depend on it for their livelihoods. Um, and it made me reflect on kind of my own um, kind of upbringing and how I grew up on a farm in Australia. And from both sides of my family, they're generational farming families, but all non-Indigenous. And it was kind of, it was kind of a bit of a moment where I did go into reflection and how my family have benefited from dispossessed land over the last 200 years. And in my upbringing, there wasn't, I didn't know too much about First Nations, especially in um, farming or agriculture. And it kind of sent, instilled in me a bit of um, guilt and kind of shame that um, the privilege that I've got today is through my family's kind of history of um, farming. And that what led me into my PhD, where I've been very fortunate to work on a project that's led by a First Nations group uh, in Victoria. And they are looking, their vision is to develop um, their indigenous food plants. And there's such a diversity here in Australia of um, indigenous food plants um, into contemporary systems. And um, yeah, it's a great way to, for me, I can feel like I can support and contribute back and really in the spirit of um, yeah, reconciliation in a way, but also to benefit all Australians. Um, it's got such a role in you know, climate resilience and all that too, that we really do listen to First Nations perspectives. And yeah, so during my week at the ELD, it was interesting to hear from all different sectors how valuable First Nations perspectives are in benefiting all of Australia and also um, in diplomacy and strengthening relations between uh, PNG in Australia. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Dylan. And next, we're going to hear from Jenna. Welcome. Hello, everybody. I forgot my order in the list then, so I'm quite surprised that I'm up next, but that's okay. Um, I am no Olympian or doctor, so just a warning there. Um, but thank you everybody for joining tonight. Thank you to the Lowy Institute um, and thank you to the Ngunnawal and every peoples for the lands that we are joining on today. Um, I was yeah, obviously selected um, as a participant in the ELD um, last year and it was a perfect opportunity to bring together an amazing group of people. And I think it was Mihai who said earlier, you know, the title, or maybe it was Jess, I don't know. The title was Emerging Leaders, but everybody was a amazing leader in their respective fields and we had such a variety um, of expertise in the room with us today. The ELD provided an opportunity um, to bring Australians and Papua New Guineans together but I also think it provided an opportunity for so many more like First Nations peoples but also Papua New Guineans who are either living in Australia or born and raised in Australia. So the voices in the room and outside wherever we went during the week um, were all absolutely amazing. We talked and laughed for a full five days. Um, my face muscles hurt by the end of it. Um, so that just shows the conversations we had, the experiences we had and the laughs we had. So um, absolutely a pleasure to be there. But for the report, and I hope you all have a chance to read it, um, this is really an opportunity and to redefine the relationship which we have. Um, Justin spoke earlier about the historical connections and we you know, all know that the close proximity and that there are those historical connections, but this is really a space where we can say, hey, let's do something different. Let's redefine what we already know and what we think and how we work to create something different. Um, and this is from all levels, right through to 
governments and ambassadors like Justin, um, right through to emerging leaders like ourselves through to grass level, uh, grassroots connections, um, which are all very, very important in their own ways. There is so much opportunity. I think there's 60 recommendations, I could be wrong. Um, and that just provides, I guess, a suite of options um, on how we actually want to look forward and implement these things. But really, I think there is so much opportunity um, opportunity in existing programs, partnerships, relationships, um, but also through new and innovative ways of connecting, uh, which are also important. I am going to keep it very short and sweet. Um, so that's all from me tonight. But thank you very much again to Mihai, Jess and Josh, um, who took many photos and got in all of our faces to get all the amazing shots that were up on the screen before. <laughs> Some not so great, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> but yes, thank you again. Um, I think on behalf of all of the ELD participants, we have created long lifetime connections and we'll be always grateful. So thank you. And last up, we have Alan Sogo Aki. Thank you. First and foremost, I'd like to thank um, Loi and DFAT for uh, organizing such a great program. Um, and also my participants, um, you guys, like we were all strangers at the start. Um, of the week and now we're friends and I've met up with several of you outside of already and like outside of the program and it's just been like overwhelming um, to have like people that are so like-minded and you know just the, the new ge the next generation coming through and um, it provides me with a lot of like obviously I, I, off the back of off the back of um, the referendum like mood was quite down on the on the uh, Monday morning and we just sort of everyone just banded naturally banded like around each other and just created a great support network for each other and I think that's was great to start off a week because it could have been either way and um, I was certainly worried about that um, you know, coming all the way from Perth at the time it's a long flight over and I was thinking about the referendum and I didn't want to be thinking about on the way back so I think uh, that's something that I, yeah, I'm grateful for the support of um, Mihai and Jess and um, all of you guys. And um, yeah, um, so a bit about myself. I'm originally from far north Queensland. I'm from Cairns. Um, I grew up there. I, you know, did school and whatnot. I did did a bit of school in Brisbane as well. Um, and uh, decided to move down, move over to Perth, and do a. Um, political science degree and I spent six years there. I graduated, I went to Ernst & Young and worked in um, infrastructure advisory for 18 months and I decided I want to go back to back home and spend a bit more time with my grandma and a few of my mates in Brisbane. So I decided to make the move and now I'm at Apt Global, um, the development firm and I work as an analyst in the Australian domestic team. and. I'm very much liking it two months in so that's that's been very great and yeah like um ever since like i've started the program professionally and from a network point of view like i've just it's just been like overwhelming with different sort of programs and that and i thank you guys for kicking it off otherwise i probably wouldn't have got the like airtime or whatnot i'd probably still be still be back in perth like punching out the keyboard and stuff but yeah um, <laughs> Anyway, um, I digress. Um, yeah, so basically, like, I think the main thing about sort of, I guess, what I took away from the week is sort of that concept, and I think it tap, taps into sort of like the challenge that we had is with uh, the referendum and so where do we go from here? So do we, do we rely on government or do we take it in our own hands and do we sort of create the our own narrative and I think that concept of self-determination what Jesse Martin was one of the speakers that spoke about I think that's I think that's the way that we have to do it and that's, a, that's also for Papua New Guinea as well so with enterprise and um, support of businesses and people like First Nations people and Papua New Guineans businesses I think that takes 
sure, like small, but you want a sort of 80, 20 or like a, like a more larger share of like, like own personal sort of, you know, funding or backing and not relying so much on the government and on all parameters and everything like that. I think that's, that's the way forward. And I think uh, with Justin, Justin's appointment, I think that's also um, been very great for us to sort of get that sort of space um, for like just to raise our issues on like a more broader sort of uh, platform and stuff. And, you know, I know there's a lot more appetite now um, since Justin's appointment for First Nations foreign policy. And I certainly hope like it continues in the future, but yeah, like I, I just, just want to basically say like together, like we're such a broad, unique bunch of people socially and professionally. And I just, I just truly believe that as a collective, this, this cohort and the previous cohorts, I think as a, as a, as a, um, you know, at, like as a cohort, we can, we can truly make a, a difference in, in Australia and Papua New Guinea just through sheer like networks and passion. And we're all on the same page. It's pretty easy. We'll, we'll kind of get along. We all want to get to the same outcome. And I think, I think eventually we will. And, you know, I have faith in the next, this generation, the next generation moving forward. So thank you. And we have a report where we have, I think it was about 60 recommendations in a huge laundry list for you to take off and work with. Uh, but, you know, it's almost like, where do you start? Even when you've got that list right in front of you. So I'm going to give you a little opportunity. You get 30 seconds. You can give one recommendation in that 30 seconds. You can give three or four. I'm going to kick it off. A little moment of indulgence for me. <laughs> Very specific as well. I would love to see a radio station program, a weekly radio station program from a First Nations person in Cairns uh, speaking with a person in Port Moresby where they talk about the local issues, they talk about issues that are important to them, broader Australia, whatever. That builds literacy between each nation, builds the knowledge and the connections as well. So I think that's a great place to start. Number two, uh, might be stealing from you here, but... Uh, I would love to see a First Nations squad in the Pacific Games uh, that can participate in each of the, uh, the uh, tournaments because we know that Australia doesn't participate in all of them, uh, but it would be great to see a First Nations team doing that. Number three, I'd love to see a play school special episode that showcases Papua New Guinea because children in Papua New Guinea watch play school. You are, this is something that actually um, I find it profoundly moving that there are children in Papua New Guinea that can sing the Australian national anthem. But here in Australia, very few children know and understand about Papua New Guinea. That needs to change. And I would love to see uh, a special episode with Play School. I think that's a good place to start, but we need to build into the curriculum too. And finally, number four, last one from me, uh, an international trade and business conference uh, showcasing First Nations businesses, uh, entrepreneurs, and joining them up with uh, people in Papua New Guinea as well, particularly showcasing the women. Thank you. I guess we'll go this way. Um, I would also like to second uh, an Indigenous team for Pacific Games. I personally went to uh, four Pacific Games and I think Australia came in in the last... Two. The, or for me personally, the last one that I competed in, which was in PNG. And I would absolutely love to see Indigenous athletes excel um, with the Pacific brothers and sisters. So I definitely agree there. And I'm just going to reiterate what I said before. I would love to see a mentorship program available for athletes, um, Indigenous athletes and PNG athletes, and having people who have represented those countries to be able to give back to the athletes. So not only does it benefit the emerging athletes, but it actually also benefits the athletes that have transitioned outside. I'm sure a lot of you are aware, you know, it's hard when you, you're an athlete and then you've got to go into an everyday normal life. I still struggle with that. Um, and I think obviously that benefits the emerging athletes coming up as well as athletes who have retired and can impart their knowledge on those transferable skills that you learn as an athlete to then take forward with you in your career, um, work and family life as well. So that's my recommendation. I, I think the first one, I, I think 
primarily like like my main passion is education. I think I think education, uh, you know, is the greatest tool we have sort of to make the difference that we're all talking about. And I think I think investing more in programs more that are more sort of future future proofing like in Papua New Guinea or even like in remote communities in Australia uh, that I've been to I've been to Arakoon, Cohen, like all um, I was fortunate enough like with, with my um with my grandma and my mum's work to be a tag along as a kid. So I've seen a lot of those communities and I think I think that's something that I'm passionate about. So it's all it's all good putting like it's all good putting money there and it's putting it there. But if it's not if it's not sort of if it's not carefully articulated and sort of worked in a way that's more that's good for that locale locale and then that locale then it's just money that's <laughs> down the drain again so i think that's one thing and another thing is with with programs and i think with the sporting programs i think it doesn't matter what sport it is there needs to be firms and there needs to be investment as the firm pathways from grassroots up to professional through the school system and the clubs need to work with the school system and then create that little sort of that go between between school and that the big time as well for people that aren't quite ready but like at a more larger like a broader scheme not just like rugby league but all types of sport that are popular in both countries i think and i think that's something that i'd, I'd recommend so yeah. i'll try to do it in 15 seconds um, get more undergraduate students to PNG. I think, yeah, that reciprocal um, learning and exchange is needed. Um, have those transformative experiences in PNG and um, lift knowledge, build those people people connections. So, yeah, time to address security concerns around um, having students go to PNG and um, build on those institutional relationships so we can, um, yeah, really support that. Again, I'll be quick. I have um, three. One, which I briefly mentioned, is looking at what we already have and looking at how we can integrate these relationships through that. Um, a second one, like Jess mentioned, is education. Um, in school in Australia, we all know we learn about Europe and countries very, very far away from us that uh, this could be controversial, may not be relevant to everybody, um, <laughs> but we don't learn about our neighbours. We barely learn about our own country. So that's a very big, important step um, for me. Um, me also, I'm very passionate about environment and sustainability, and I think looking at nature-based solutions, um, which both First Nations Australians and Papua New Guineans have to solving our climate crisis is very important. Uh, that's all, thanks. Um, I have just two, um, and I think this is one that is often, you know, in policy and it's in, you know, your reconciliation action plan or, you know, some kind of inclusion and diversity um, policy, but it isn't really implemented. Um, let's really listen to Indigenous peoples and First Nations peoples and just be uncomfortable in silence and, and really listen to what they want because they do have the knowledge and they do have... They do know what, what they need. And I think this happens in Papua New Guinea when aid programs, for example, a, an example was given by one of the um, Papua New Guinean participants where a gender program didn't include males, an Australian um, gender program. We can't progress issues like gender without the support of men. And this was a top-down approach. And this is common in policy and this is common in international development where it's not locally led and it doesn't come from the locals. And I think it's the same here in Australia. Indigenous people don't necessarily feel heard and, and and recommendations are not implemented in many, many areas. How, how, do, we, how do we improve that? Um, do, do we, Australia, want to improve that for First Nations people in, 
in Australia? Do we want to improve that for Papua New Guineans? Um, I think, you know, there's people from many sectors in the room here and, and we all have our experiences, but I think, you know, the answers are there. And, and in all our discussions last year at the ELD, that, that was a common theme you know, lo locally led initiatives and really, really listen. And, and the, the second one um, is, I've actually forgotten it. <laughs> Must have been. <laughs> I, I, something I, I also um, feel strongly about and um, contributed to in, in the report is, um, understanding the cross-cultural context. And again, we read it in reports and we read it in, in all sorts of documents, but I was on the plane um, with a young Papua New Guinean woman who works for DT Global. She actually applied for ELD and, and didn't get in. Um, but, you know, she said that she carries a cultural load when she has um, expatriates coming and working in Port Moresby and she has to do her job as well as um, explaining cultural dynamics um, to expatriates and and I thought um, you know the same thing with um, you know the DFAT um, you know pre-posting program where where is that um, why why do we just for PNG learn talk pissing why don't we learn how to read a room <laughs> and watch, you know, when people are not speaking, it doesn't mean that they don't have anything to con contribute. There are often a lot of cultural dynamics at play in the room that if you haven't grown up around it, you won't know. So I'm not, I'm not sure whether this is something that's um, – the intention is there, but I think that it would help to improve all these relation one-on-one -on -one relationships and also, you know, relationships at the business and government level. Thank you. I'm going to uh, come with one massive ask because we're imagining we're talking to the foreign minister um, and I work for the ABC. Uh, <laughs> we want $100 million over... <laughs> Over four years, I, we've been, you know, in the last, over the next four years, the government's given us $32 million and we've demonstrated that through that money, we're able to recruit a much more diverse workforce of people from the Pacific Islands. But if we want to keep doing that work, we're going to need a lot more money so that we can, you know, ramp up our operations in a place like PNG. So that's what I'm going to ask for. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This is just a quarter of the group. Imagine what you hear throughout the week with all of them there. It was just unreal. Thank you so much for all your contributions tonight. You deserve that. So that wraps us up for tonight. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, is it? We're, we've got it until about eight o'clock-ish, says the boss. Um, I'm going to close off tonight uh, because I wanted to take the opportunity to say not only thank you to all to you all here being here to hear us tonight, take an interest in the work that we've put forward and all the ideas that have been contributed by these good people, uh, but also to say thank you to Mihai. Uh, he's moving into the role of director of the Pacific Program in a couple of weeks, so uh, I just <laughs> congratulations. We have worked together on the Emerging Leaders Dialogue, well, the AusPNG Network Project, uh, for the past nearly three years. We've done two ELDs, we've got another one coming up soon. Uh, I can say that he has taken it from zero to 100. He has lifted the bar on this stuff. It is unreal what he's been doing with it. I want to thank you for your leadership. I want to thank you for everything that you've done for building the ties between Australia and Papua New Guinea. Now, I encourage you to grab one of the ELDs tonight, ask some questions. We have six of them here tonight uh, for you to grab and ask questions. <laughs> That's a good and thanks again for coming out tonight.